As we prepare to receive God's word, let us join our hearts in prayer. O Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 22. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase. And in the event of war... Join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. 
But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shifra and Pua should be arrested right this second. Who do they think they are? Just a couple of lowly midwives. They are nobodies, delusional women. And they think they can take the law into their own hands like that? If they want the laws to be changed, they should do it decently and in order. Run for office, write some letters, but have some respect for authority. This is not a free-for-all here. The Pharaoh has made it clear. He has told these women straight to their faces, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women, if it is a boy, kill him. Now this all started when a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. This new king didn't remember the stories of how Joseph, an outsider and foreigner, had spared all of Egypt during the years of famine. He either hadn't heard or hadn't paid attention. But the only reason that the Israelites are living in Egypt in the first place is because of the good that Joseph was doing there. Joseph was like a brother to that former king. And when Joseph's extended family came to live in Egypt, they were welcomed with open arms. At the end of Genesis, Joseph is even buried in Egypt in his adopted hometown. Back in those days, it seems like Egyptians and Israelites lived side by side in relative peace. And maybe these two peoples had their own traditions and customs and religious practices, but at the end of the day, they helped each other. They were a blessing to each other. But that was a long time ago. So long, nobody even remembers. And now the Egyptians, or at least the ruling class among them, are worried. What if the Israelite people keep reproducing? What if we Egyptians are outnumbered? What if we aren't even the majority 20 years from now? What if the Israelites get an idea to take over? What if one day we are at war? Will the Israelites fight alongside our enemies? Will they take advantage of the situation? The new Pharaoh is afraid. It's a fear that is only grounded in his imagination and all of these what ifs, but he is afraid. So he sets taskmasters over the Israelites with one goal, to oppress them with forced labor. He wants to make the Israelites miserable to stifle their energy, 
to weaken their family and social units and to slow down their birth rate. Pharaoh's ideas spread easily. Egyptians largely agree with him on this one, plus they've got a world-class military on their side. They don't want to be the minority. So the story says the Egyptians became ruthless against the Israelites and made their lives bitter. But it's not working well enough. The Israelites are still multiplying. So the Pharaoh gives a new order. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. Now, I don't think the king suddenly has this soft spot for baby girls. In ancient Egypt, a person's lineage and ethnicity is drawn through the father's lines. So this order accomplishes two things. For one, those Israelite girls won't have Israelite men to marry and have families with. But even if there should be interracial marriages, which surely there were, the resulting children would be considered Egyptian based off of the father's ethnicity. So the Pharaoh is trying to wipe out this whole people, even though he relies on them and the Egyptian economy relies on them for brick production and field labor. And then come along some disobedient, clever midwives. It's not completely clear whether Shifra and Pua are Israelites or Egyptians themselves. Their names could be from either language. And when the passage calls them Hebrew midwives, it could just as easily be translated as midwives of the Hebrews. But since Pharaoh comes to them directly and commands them as if they're all on the same page here, it seems like these are Egyptian women who attend the deliveries for the Hebrews. And if that's true, then you could easily call Shifra and Pua traitors. They are not loyal to their own leader or to their own military or to the expressed priorities of their own country. They are unmoved by all that hype about the Hebrews becoming the majority or whether or not Israelites can be trusted, the need to keep them under Egypt's control. They won't allow those messages to dominate their worldview or to dictate their actions. They fear God more than Pharaoh. And they put themselves on the line for the sake of their foreign neighbors. They let the boys live. When the king questions them about it, they outright lie to him. They tell him, oh, these Hebrew women, they're so strong and vigorous. They give birth so quickly, it's over before the midwives can even get there. So this is clearly in the days when men still have no idea what's happening during labor and delivery. And the story ends that God is pleased with the midwives. God deals well with them and gives them families of their own. And just think, all these generations later, we know their names, Shifra and Pua. That's how important they were to the story of God's people. By the way, we don't know the name of that Egyptian king. Do Shifra and Pua 
overturn the entire system of injustice? No. Do they save the life of every single child? No. Does Shifra and Pua's bravery expose to their fellow Egyptians how flawed that law was? Probably not. At least it doesn't change the feelings of the majority. So was it all for nothing? What's the point? If after all their bravery, nothing really changes. Shifra and Pua couldn't fix everything, but they worked within their own realm of influence with what little power they had to do the good that they could, to stand up with the oppressed, to protect the vulnerable. And they spared enough children to make way for a new generation that would include Moses. Their names are recorded for a reason. Shifra and Pua are our role models. They show us how to sift through the loud, competing voices of the day, the fear-mongering, the name-calling, the what-ifs, and to hear the voice of God above it. They teach us how we can look at families of a different race or religion or social group than our own and to see them as our neighbors and our partners and most of all as children of God. Maybe they can even remind us that in the midst of something as messy as childbirth or as sinful as slavery or as hopeless as this attempted genocide. In the midst of life-threatening situations or devastating disasters or just plain evil. The Lord is there, steadying our hands, lifting our voices, and paving the way for release. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. And as you do, may the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sustain you now and forever. Amen.